What in the world is... Dad, this is dopey. Huh? Huh? Well, where did you find it? It uh, followed us home. We found him in the jungle. He's a brontosaur. Oh, yes, I, I can see that. Can we keep him? Can... Where? But I could train him. Wow. Kick his legs out from under him and holler, sit? Oh, now, sure, that'd do it. Oh, please, Dad. He won't be any trouble. Um, how are you going to feed him, Holly? Oh, he'll eat anything. He'll eat everything. There's no time. No. O'clock. Hey, it's episode 90. Yeah, this is an interesting one. I've been wanting to cover this one for a while. Yeah, you were act- we were actually going to do this one last week, and we had been yeah. talking about this was the one we were going to do last week, but then, you know, we had to do the original Night Sucker because that dude got caught. Yeah, so what, so. what are we going to call this show? What are we going to call it? That's what, well, I was having a hard time because <laughs> I'm going to have to explain. Yeah. You told me about this. You wanted to do this, like, a long time ago. Yeah. You were like, I used to have one of those Mysteries and the Unexplained kind of books, you know, yeah, like, because I have some of those. It's a big, huge book, yeah. And you were Hard like, cover. yeah, and you were, like, fascinated with this one or two particular stories in there. Yeah, well, it was actually a whole section in the book. It was, like, a chapter on this subject. Yeah. And it had dozens and dozens of stories from, I think, the 1800s and the early 1900s. Yeah. About guys finding toads in rocks. Or in lumps of coal and, and finding weird, like, um, pterodactyls and stuff like that, dinosaurs. Right. Yeah, and I was just, and this and these were evidently featured in newspapers of the time. Yeah. And I always wanted to know if there was anything to this. It, it was weird. because It was a very, very popular detailed. trend at the time. Like, to, I didn't yeah. realize until I started looking into this. Yeah. But then I was like, well, he wanted he wanted to call it, I said, well, we'll call it, like, Fortean archaeology because, yeah. you know, Charles Fort and Fortean. Yeah, and but nobody knows, who, nobody knows what that is, though. Right. Right, but well, yeah, but that's what it's called. That's what it's called. And then I was like, well, I want a couple more. I want to talk about the frogs. I want to talk about yeah. the pterodactyl. I was like, I need a couple other things to round the stuff out. So we kind of decided to do naturalistic or pseudo archaeology that has been used to support creationism because then I can kind of narrow it down a little bit. Right. I mean, mostly I want to talk about the frogs and the right. pterodactyl, but I got a so couple. So we'll other call things it too. something like toads and rocks or toads and holes or to- <laughs> something because if you say forty and archaeology. Archaeology and modern people don't know what the hell that is, so you can't. Right. It's not a good tagline, you know. We'll put that in. in but in. this was just, yeah. This right. was a topic you wanted to do for a long yeah. time. And like when I started doing, it's kind of one of those topics that once you start looking into it, like there's this huge rabbit hole of yeah. like, all this interrelated weird shit that I didn't yeah. Know about. Back in the old days, you know, most people heated their homes with coal. They bought lots of coal, and they'd have these reports of throwing lumps of coal into fire. And a frog jumping out of the flames, right. or a toad, or a horned toad, or but it's usually frogs. And then they'd pull a lump of coal out, and it would be cracked in half, and you could see a perfect little frog pocket in, yeah. in the lump of coal, as if the coal had formed around the frog, and the frog had been in there for millions of years. Right, and was like still that. alive somehow. Right. <laughs> Yeah, this is like a really weird, very specific thing. So, like I said, we're kind of going to go into that. This is kind of a weird topic, but Tom's been wanting to do this one for a long time because of a book that he had when he was a kid, and he found it really fascinating. Before we get to all that, let me do uh, the shout-outs and the news stories and all that regular stuff. First shout-out I want to do, well, I usually talk about my book, The Faceless Villain. As I said, I'm still working on volume two. Hoping that I have it out by June, but we'll see how it goes. It's, you know, it's a lot of work and I'm kind of getting behind, but, you know, it'll be summertime anyway. So keep an eye out for that. Uh, If you haven't seen our latest movie review, it was... Dagon, yeah, directed very by Stuart Gordon. Been yeah, very popular. And we're trying to get this movie some more love because I really, really, really like this movie and I feel like it's not that appreciated Yeah, because no. it came out much later than uh, than most of his other stuff and it never got a theatrical release in the US. Yeah, I went to go try to get Dagon on Blu-ray because I wanted a Blu-ray copy of it and none are available. But uh, there's a company going to do a Blu-ray release. It's like a collector's edition Blu-ray release with a bunch of extras, and I think it's going to be remastered. It's coming out July 25th of this year, of 2018. They're already accepting pre-orders. I may put in a pre-order for that. I would love to have that on Blu-ray. Yeah, it's an awesome movie. That's a really good movie. Seeing it again, you know, it makes you want to own it. 
And I want to, I want to, you know, get some behind the scenes info on it, you know, of what it was yeah, like. Yeah, because I'm kind of, yeah, I'm kind of curious about that. Right. Like I said, it doesn't really get much uh, attention, which the, is a shame because it's were, really good. There were evidently some Region B Blu-ray releases, which was what Germany or it's something that's European. A, yeah, it's a European. Um, well, it might be Spain because that's where I mean, I'm be. sure it's like a European kind of. Yeah. Because I think that was the only place that it had a theatrical release. Was right. Spain. But I, I want this new release though. That, yeah. And the, the cover looked really cool. I'm excited. So I'm just letting anybody know you know fans if you haven't seen Dagon go back and watch our review yeah we didn't that really can, spoil it no not really and you can watch it for free on Tubi TV it's it's a really good Lovecraftian horror yeah and uh, also be sure to check out our Zazzle store at zazzle.com slash 13 o'clock and we have shirts and a tote bag uh, check out our Patreon page if you would like to give us a donation, or you can go to our blog, which is 13 o'clock podcast.wordpress.com, and there is a link in the sidebar to a PayPal account if you'd like to give a one time donation, just like these three wonderful people did. Eric, and I know I'm pronouncing this wrong. I pronounced it wrong before. That's Jamin. Jamin. Yeah. Yes. Jamin, yeah. And Kieran. Yeah. They have, all three of them have given us PayPal donations in the last week. Yeah, and Eric and Jamin gave the same amount. They were pretty uh, heavy hitters yes, right there. Right. Thanks, guys. That was a, that was a very, very uh, much appreciated. Very much appreciated and donated all donations are, are uh, appreciated thanks Kieran uh, but uh, Eric and Jamin man uh, we're impressed thank you very much yes that was very very nice of you guys yeah all right so before we get to the main topic let me do our little news stories I couldn't really find anything that was like archaeologically related yeah. really the news bring in the news remember I had to have I a thought you song? were gonna do Danzig though yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you forgot no nah, never mind never mind <laughs> I'm gonna do the news oh yes yeah there you go. That. okay all right I'm gonna keep that and I'm going to play that at the beginning of every old news segment. I can do it better than that. You just, you know, you, you okay. catch me on short notice. I'll have to get you when you're drunk or something. the news. Speaking of being drunk, we yeah. went out this Saturday night. Yeah. Uh, we hadn't been out in several weeks. Yeah. So we had a very good time. It was very fun. Yeah. Even though it was Cinco de Mayo. But it I was wasn't. dancing on the car. Yeah, you yeah. actually got on top of my car yeah, we in the home. driveway and danced on yeah, we got top back. of my car. Well, the neighbors were watching. Yeah. <laughs> and there was, a good, there was a good song playing. That was uh, Death in Rome. Yeah, it was, it was Death a, in it, Rome. It was, it was a cover of... Uh, I think it was a cover of Careless Whisper. I think, it? Oh, yeah, it was a cover of that Careless Whisper. Song. So I just rolled out of the car, started dancing, and then climbed up the hood of the car and was on top of the car, crushed it all in. <laughs> but, you know, I just... Open the door and smack, smack yeah, it out of my hand and pop back out, you know. The neighbors were amused, I think. Yeah, they thought it was hilarious. <laughs> Our neighbors are cool. It's we know them. It's fine. <laughs> yeah, they, they've seen us at the club. They know yeah. how we are. <laughs> yeah, it was okay. Yeah. So the news stories, um, I just, these are like just three funny ones that I found from like a news of the weird site or something like that. I don't know, like I had heard of this shit before, but I don't know how many of you guys have heard of it. So in 2010, there was this book that came out called The Boy Who Came Back from Heaven. What? And it was a huge bestseller. Oh, yeah, you yeah, remember, yeah, remember? yeah. It was yeah. a kid, and he was in a car accident. Yeah. And he woke up, and he was a quadriplegic. Yeah. And he allegedly told his dad that he yeah. saw heaven, and he met Jesus, and all yeah. this other kind of stuff. And his dad was like, ka-ching, yeah. and wrote a book about that shit. Yeah. Okay, well, five years later, that kid came out and said, no, I made it all up. Yeah, and they, they, had, they had him on, they had him on uh, Oprah and all kinds of the, 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 the morning talk shows that we have here in the U.S. Yeah, it was everywhere. Yeah, I and, remember that book being never, and I don't yeah. even pay attention now, to that kind of shit, and I still saw it. Now, for, the foreign, for any of our foreign listeners, you know, like Australia, U.K., India, anything, we, we have these daytime morning type talk shows. They have them there, too. They have them there. Well, <laughs> here, I don't know what the deal is television is a dying medium even cable tv it's just dying if you look at the age demographics of who's watching it's you know 75 and above and uh it caters to the lowest common denominator it's the ultimate in just stupid shit is what they have on the on, on well yeah it's television. just dumb like dumb 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 yeah or just stuff that's like now we're like hey we're gonna show people how to make pancakes and yeah we're gonna, like, it's you know? ridiculous. I, I was it's funny and we're gonna talk to this kid who says he went to heaven when I had to go, when I had to go back to Mississippi you know when my dad was getting sick I actually went to relatives homes they were watching television still and it was like going backwards in time <laughs> you're like oh my god what like, century is it yeah and, 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 and there's like it was kind of like hilarious because there's like 
the people working on the television stations are in their early 20s and they're making them, like you say, cook a meal. Okay, well, today we're going to we're gonna cook, you know, eggs and whatever, you know. <laughs> and I'm thinking to myself, this poor girl, she's got to wake up in the morning and do this show to cater to, 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 a, to, a, to a culture well, that isn't hers. It's probably a, you know, a, you know it's a stepping stone for her. She yeah. might be an intern or something yeah, like that. Stepping she stone, get a better job later stepping on. Stepping stone to the death of television. You yeah, know, I mean, you she know, probably wants to work in the movies. No, she probably wants. She probably actually wants to work on YouTube. Well, yeah, <laughs> she does have a show on YouTube. She, she's yeah, so probably does. She can, yeah. yeah, you actually can have right. a bigger YouTube show than you have a television show. But yeah, so this kid was everywhere. The funniest thing to me about this story yeah. is that the kids, and this is apparently their real name. Their yeah. last name is Malarkey. Okay. <laughs> And I'm like, well, that should have been your first yeah, clue yeah, yeah. right there. Yeah. The kid's name is Alex Malarkey, and his dad, the guy who wrote the book, is named Kevin Malarkey. Now, even though in 2015, the kid, who had you know grown up a little bit by then, obviously, came out and said, no, I made it all up. I didn't really see heaven. I didn't meet yeah. Jesus. It's all bullshit. And uh, he told that to The Guardian in 2015. But now, I guess... But I don't know if people didn't believe him or anything like that. Yeah. So now, he's actually filing a complaint against the book's publisher, which is Tyndale House or Tyndale House, whatever, how you pronounce it. And his uh, he is alleging that, quote, any reasonable person would have realized that it was highly unlikely that the content of the book was true. <laughs> well, I'm like, I oh, guess man. a lot of people did not realize that. They were not reasonable. They could have changed their last name to, Bl- to Blarney. <laughs> if you, any of you people go to Ireland and go kiss that Bl- Blarney stone, don't kiss that Blarney stone. <laughs> I had some Irish friends when I was in Boston. They piss on that Blarney Stone. Don't fucking piss. Don't kiss it. (laughs) Pro tip. Yeah, don't don't kiss it. So yeah, even though evidently the kid is not suing his dad, even though, this is very interesting, apparently the kid never got any royalties from the book sale. The dad got all of it. (laughs) Dad making money. Yeah, off of his crippled child. Yeah. I mean, is there anything lower than that? On, on, on a related related subject, you know what I mean. I had a near death experience during a motorcycle wreck. I don't know if it's real, man, but it it did. I I did have that stereotypical kind of like tunnel of light. It was mine was a little bit different, and then being surrounded by kind of like these angelic being type people that know you, and you know, I had that experience. I don't really mock that experience. I don't have any proof of whether or not it was real or not. You know, some people were saying that, you know, it's the hallucinations of a dying brain. I don't know. Seemed real to me. But the thing is, is that th- it didn't happen to this kid. He yeah. just, they just made it up. He just said he made yeah. it up. Well, and actually, he's kind of alleging that his dad just his made, dad it made it Although up. Although he's not right. suing his dad. He's just suing the publisher saying, hey, the publisher should have known that this was crap and they right. shouldn't have published it in the first place because like i said evidently this kid didn't get any royalties out of this even though i'm oh. sure that that book sold like a bajillion copies yeah. i remember it being on all the fucking morning shows like you said i remember right. being on the bestseller list and all that other kind of stuff so you know i don't know how that's gonna go nah, but that if, was, you wanna, if you guys want to know about that shit get our book man mountain poultry guys my yeah because I, I yeah i do talk about there's it a little that. bit of a segment where I, I tell the entire story about my near-death experience and actually you know some of the stuff that i saw or was shown during my near-death experience kind of came to pass now i don't know maybe you know just probability would make it come to pass anyway yeah and you know we do have an ability to kind of take the situation we're in now and estimate or extrapolate what it's probably going to be like in a couple years i mean that's you know the human mind can do that but it's just weird you know when you're having it in a near-death context is it a real phenomenon or do you really go into the into the astral plane and see it well i don't know you know i hadn't an OBE too, you know, a spontaneous out of body experience before that, that didn't involve death. I was just falling asleep. And I tell that story also, they were similar, but out of the two OBE seemed to be more air quotes, real than NDE. Just it's what it felt like. It felt like OBE felt more real than NDE, but they might both be real. I don't know. I don't know. So I don't, I'm not going to mock the experience. I'm just going to mock the, what this, that story. And like I Dad said, made it up. I, I love yeah. that their last name is Malarkey. I'm like, that yeah. can't be real. That can't yeah. be real. I yeah. guess that is somebody's last yeah, name. Yeah. I don't know if in all countries, Malarkey means the same thing. Malarkey means bullshit, bullshit. in the United States. <laughs> it's, like, it's, much, bullshit. Yeah. it's it's a little <laughs> bit of an antiquated term, Yeah, but most people still know what still it know means. Still know what it means, right? You yeah. Know? So I just thought that I was like, is that really their name? Oh my yeah. God. You've got to be kidding me. Okay. So yeah, there's that story. I don't know right. how that whole lawsuit's going to go down. This yeah, one, you brought that up and I was able to even plug the book. Ain't that so I know. I know that's pretty awesome. I, yeah, pretty, I worked, worked it plugged in somehow. You're pretty slick. I know. He's, 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 he's
this is like motherfucker. Yeah, and I'm only on two cups of coffee. You just woke up, you know what I mean? I'm already plugged. <laughs> yeah, we were supposed to record this yesterday, but we were too hungover. Yeah. <laughs> All right, so this one's kind of funny. This was another, uh, you know how, how I love these Easter Bunny theme stories? I did yeah. one last uh, last time or the time before last about the woman that uh, tased her son. Yeah. This actually, this took place at Richland Carousel Park in Mansfield, Ohio. And evidently, they had uh, an Easter Bunny there that all the kids could come and sit on their lap and stuff mm. like that. You know, it's just a little amusement park or whatever. And uh, this woman named LaDonna Hugit or Hewitt or something like that, 54 years old, March 24th, she shows up, sits on the Easter Bunny's lap, mm. and <laughs> proceeds to, quote, grab him in inappropriate ways okay, yeah. and start making lewd comments. Awesome. <laughs> and there is actually somebody filmed it on their cell phone because I did yeah, find yeah. like a very blurry like yeah. picture of it that somebody had taken. She sat on that the... lap and felt something and gave her an idea. I guess so. <laughs> she then, okay, this is what the news story said. This was, uh, this was from some TV uh, thing in Ohio, but she said she then moved on to ride a horse on the carousel. Yeah. Also in ways witnesses described as lewd. Yeah. <laughs> So one of them was ready to go, you know. Yeah, she was. Yeah, 54 years good. old. She's, she hadn't had it for a while, I guess. And feeling the Easter Bunny yeah. looked pretty good. Maybe she yeah. was a furry. She's into that. No, no judgment. But the funny thing was uh, the, the uh, police chief, I love the quote that he has. He says, as soon as you think you hear all, yeah. I've never heard of somebody performing those types of acts on the Easter Bunny. <laughs> <laughs> he doesn't go to those kind of right. websites, y'all. Yeah, yeah. He doesn't know anything right. about that. So, yeah, this woman was uh, arrested for public drunkenness, obviously. And I love the way she that... She's had a good time. Yeah. <laughs> and then the way the end of the story says, she is no longer welcome at the amusement oh, park. <laughs> <shit>. <laughs> That's funny. I guess not. Those kids are like, Mommy, what is that yeah, lady yeah. doing? Actually, those kids nowadays probably know exactly what yeah. that lady was doing. All right. So the third story, this was from the Minneapolis Star Tribune. And uh, this says there, there's an old uh, Dayton's department store. It's a really, really big, uh, cool looking building. And they've been renovating it in downtown Minneapolis. And in early April, they came across a mummified monkey. Wow. Yeah. Okay. And at first they were like, what the fuck is this doing in here? But yeah. apparently in the 1960s, yeah. the store had a pet department uh-huh. and had a monkey, which... You're right. Okay. Must escape. And I guess it escaped and got into the air conditioning ducts and maybe died up there. Well, yeah, indeed. And so, yeah, so it has been up there for all of these years. Damn. And it's like mummified. So there's a picture of it. I found a picture of it. What did it look like? Like a mummified monkey. Put that on the Put that on I will, on, yeah. On I'll, the put it, I'll put it in the okay, YouTube Okay, so you're video. looking at a picture of a mummified monkey. Yeah. So okay. they found... Isn't that weird, though? It's like yeah. they said they I haven't seen it. it. I'm, I'm just yeah, pretending it's like, like I'm looking it's at too, it. It's totally yeah. gross. Yeah. They, but they said, yeah, the mummy uh, does show an injury to the abdomen. So they think he might have like walked into an exhaust fan or got hurt oh, okay, by an exhaust yeah. fan and that's what killed him. So I don't right. think he starved to death or anything like right. that. Got hurt. I, and I love the uh, the spokeswoman for the redevelopment team. She says, we continue to find pieces of history in the Dayton's project <laughs> as we redevelop the building. <laughs> She's like, please let me not find yeah. any mummified people in yeah. here. Mummified monkey, that's bad enough. All right. So actually, that's a pretty good segue into our main topic. Like I said, we're talking about what used to be called back in the old days, Forty in archaeology and a lot of these books from the era and ones yeah. we were talking about that kind of came out in the 50s 60s stuff like that mm-hmm. um when they were still kind of calling it that and even up into the 70s like when yeah. in search of and the shit book like that. that i was reading i think was from the late 70s but the, yeah. the stories were coming from 1900s mm. maybe like 20s 30s 1880s around that time yeah and this was like apparently a really popular you know weird tale because yeah. there are shit loads of these okay Shitloads. Yeah, when I heard these stories, you know, it captured my imagination. I was like, could these be real? What's the motive to make up a story like this? And, like, some of them involve miners making train tunnels and breaking into caves that had what seemingly would be, you know, prehistoric creatures. You know, uh, basically we're talking about dinosaurs. Yeah. Or small dinosaurs, not big dinosaurs, but small dinosaurs. And sounded real, you know what I mean? Evidently, lots of witnesses to it. And But I wanted you to look into it and uh, tell me what you found. Because yeah, I don't know. It's like maybe we should st- just tell a couple of stories. Yeah, I mean, we'll- the strange thing about this, the phenomena of frogs and toads, it's almost always frogs and toads. Sometimes yeah. lizards. Yeah. But they are usually 
have you guys have seen that like uh, that Looney Tunes cartoon about the frog that's in the uh, in the stone and he opens his and it can sing and dance and stuff, you know? Hey, yeah. Oh, my baby, that guy. Yeah. That's kind of like that, where it's like they'll they'll open like a rock or they'll open a piece of coal, like you said, or yeah. a le- or like a tree. Yeah. And then there'll be like a little frog like sealed in there. Yeah. In like, a little like it gap. Grew, like it grew around it. Like it grew around him. Or that the rock formed around him. Around. I'm not really sure. It seems like the fad for this type of story Mm -hmm. kind of started in the Victorian era for some reason there was a huge rage in the Victorian era for for this kind of story and I kind of thought because in later years from my understanding creationists started using that you know to kind of bolster creationism in a weird way because they're like oh they're they're from before the flood they were put there or something like that these stories would not support creationism (laughs) in the modern mind but for some reason in the Victorian mind yeah because you gotta think I mean a lot of them started coming about like right around around the time that Charles Darwin published right. on the origin of species. So there was kind of a lot of uh, shit going on about so that. So maybe a, a creationist could say, well, of course the earth is not that old. Right. Because this rock formed around something. Around this rock. Around yes. this, frog, this frog. And the frog could probably only live for a couple of years, you know what I mean, in mud. So the mud turned into stone. So your you know, your ideas about geology are wrong. Maybe, Maybe that's, that's what, what they're talking Even about. Even though some of them were saying that they thought, oh, the frogs have been in there for thousands or millions right. of years. And that's my understanding when I read the, the story is that when I was reading these stories, I was thinking they were trying to tell me these frogs had been preserved in this yeah, rock I thought for that millions was the of years. That, of the that, story. that it was in suspended animation. Yeah. Basically. And when they tell the story and then give the account, they describe the frog and you're going like, damn, that, that frog maybe was in there for a million years. What kind of frog is that? <laughs> you know? It's a magic frog. Yeah, kind of cool. Make a wish. Yeah. Is this really happening or whatever? So. Right. So most of these stories, like I said, now the first ones come from like the 15th century. Okay. Now the That f- old? 15th century? Yeah. The, okay. So like, so this is a kind of a popular story. So it's been around for a long story. time. Yeah. Okay. And I don't know why. It was just like there was a trend for these kind of stories. Now, well, there was no Darwin there, so there was no, so no concept of creationism, really. They yeah. weren't trying to fight Darwin, so 1500s, and then maybe there was something to this. Well, tell me what you found. Well, according to the 40th times like i said uh named after it was charles fort was his name right he was he was kind of a guy he liked to collect all kinds nowadays they would probably just call it paranormal or weird mysteries but it's you know okay. sometimes called 40 in or 40 on okay. or something like that just because it's like in, a mis- miscatonic university to, yeah in deference yeah. to that guy now if you look on the this phenomena is usually called toads in the hole just like that british dish with the egg or whatever <laughs> But if you want to uh, see accounts of it, it's a uh, Wikipedia page is actually called Entombed Animals because it's a it's a big thing. So according to Fortean Times, about 210 entombed animal cases have been described in Europe, North America, Africa, Australia, and New Zealand since the 15th century. And even people like Ben Franklin and stuff like that have repeated these stories. You know, it, the problem with a lot of these stories is that a lot of them are just like hearsay. Right. Like a guy will say, you know, for an example, in 1865, there was a article in the Hartlepool Free Press. It says reported that excavators working on a block of magnesium limestone taken from about 25 feet underground in England discovered a cavity that had a live toad in it. Now, this was in 1865. Yeah. They did not have any photographs of it. Right. Pretty much all they had was someone say so. Right. So that's kind of the problem with a lot of these stories. So and they're, they're, they're digging through magnesium limestone. Is that what they call yeah. it? Yeah. And they found an empty pocket. Yeah. And a and frog-shaped that, pocket with a living frog. Okay. In it. So frog-shaped pocket. We're not talking about a big area. Right. Like the size of yeah, a Yeah, usually, like, that's it's why they exactly call it the entombed shape. animal. It's, it's, it's only, like, a little bit bigger than the frog. Okay. As though the rock formed around it. And the frog was alive. Yeah. Ro- what they were Allegedly. Born. Allegedly alive. Okay. Now, it's it a weird story. Yeah, like, so around the same time, in the, in the 1860s, okay, so there was an article in Scientific American, and this is talking about a silver miner named Moses Gaines. Mm-hmm. And he found a toad inside of a boulder that was like two feet in diameter. Mm-hmm. And same kind of thing. It was like a little pocket. He says that the the frog was three inches long and very plump and fat. <laughs> okay. Evidently, I mean, Scientific American says many well-authenticated stories of the finding of live toads and frogs in solid rock, solid rock are on record. Okay. Now, hold on one second. At the time that these stories appear, were any claims made? You know what I'm talking about? Were they claiming anything or just, or just, oh, I found a toad? Pretty much. 
much that seems to be the whole thing of it. And I'm not, like I said, I'm not really sure why there was such a rash of these types of stories. Like the yeah. like I said, the Victorians love this kind of thing yeah. where it's like there's some miner is like chipping away at a rock and he's like, hey, there's a live frog in there. Isn't that neat? Well, what's what's what I find unusual is that if you're gonna hoax a story about finding a live frog sealed inside of a stone, that hoax better support some kind of a claim that you're making. Like, see, it's true what what's his name said. It's true that rock isn't very old. There yeah. doesn't seem to be any claim made. We found a frog. It was in a stone. It's like I hot. said, this is what seemed weird. Yeah. And like I said, when you first started talking about it, I'm like, yeah, I kind of remember vaguely hearing about that. Yeah. But the more I looked into it, I'm like, man, it was like a shitload of these types of stories. Well, that's it why was just like a trend for them. Well, that's why when, when I read this section in that book, it was like an encyclopedia of the unexplained. Yeah. And they must have had a hundred of them in that one section. Yeah, there's a shit ton. I'm going, what the hell? There's like over 200 of these yeah, stories. Yeah, I'm like, what the hell is this about? Because there were no claims made. Yeah, it was just like, oh, Look by the found. way. We found a rock. Yeah. <laughs> like a rock with a frog in it. Right. And I don't know. It's like super weird. And every now and then, like like I said, it's almost always a toad or a frog. Yeah. Sometimes, though, it's a lizard. Okay. Now, this happened in uh, 1821. And again, this just turned up in a magazine. And it's like a secondhand account of somebody saying, you know, this guy was a stonemason. He's working on a big chunk of rock that was that had been 22 feet below the ground. And he found a lizard embedded in the stone. He said it was coiled up in a round cavity of its own form. And that was like the exact impression of the animal as though it had yeah. formed around him. He said he thought it was dead, but then five minutes later, it started running around. Uh -huh. He said, he, he says, quote, it soon ran about with much celerity. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, okie doke then. So he's claiming that he fi finds a coiled up lizard, lizard. in a little shape. What's funny is that I've we have lots of lizards around our house. I've never seen one actually coil. They Not seem, to, they seem yeah. to like just lay out flat. Yeah, they lay out flat so they can literally like little right. solar panels so they can get all the sun. But okay, let's say it's coiled up in a stone and I guess it's in suspended animation. You expose it to the air and after a few minutes it just kind of wakes up and yeah. psh, takes off unaffected. Yeah. It's funny because as the years went on, because there are some accounts of ones in trees also... And yeah. it's not always just one. Sometimes it's a bunch. Okay. You know what I mean? And there's like, they'll be like in this pocket in this tree, there'll be like 60 of them in there, like little ones. Little frogs. And then yeah. they can't figure out how they got in there because there's no hole, there's no air, there's no food. They right. can't figure out how they get in or out or anything like that. Then as the years went on with more modern building methods and stuff, you started getting stories about ones uh, like a turtle embedded in a plaster wall. Um, what? You know, like, you know, you get ones in like concrete floors and shit like that. I mean, there was even one, I don't even know what year this was from, but uh, Julian Huxley, who quite a famous biologist, he got a letter from a guy who was like a, like a laborer in yeah. uh, Devonshire. And he said that he broke up some concrete flooring to put some pipe in there. He had a sledgehammer and he's like, that looks like a frog's leg. So they both bend down and they look in there and there was a frog. There was, tw there was actually 23 frogs yeah. in this concrete floor that were like embedded in there. In a pocket or spread out? I don't know. It doesn't really, doesn't say. really say. But like it. I said, this is just, this is a guy yeah. writing a letter to a biologist. I guess. Now it should be noted that a lot of biologists at the time, even at the time in the Victorian era were like, <coughs> bullshit <laughs> yeah. kind of thing. Right. Because biologists have done studies of this phenomena, even going back to, I believe the earliest one was maybe 1711, I want to say. Uh -huh. But they definitely did ones later on in the 1800s where they would take poor little froggies mm. and they would embed them in rocks, like put them in rocks with no air, no food, anything mm. like that, and then bury them okay. and see how long they would live. Uh -huh. None of them did. <laughs> <laughs> No, I'm dead. Yeah. They're like, now, the ones that were um, a later, I think they did an um, experiment in the 1820s. And one that they did, they said, now, the frogs that were in limestone, mm -hmm. they lived about a year. But limestone has pores, so they could actually get some air. And some frogs, like even some desert frogs and stuff like that, can hibernate for quite a long time. Right. They so the ones they put in limestone they lived for a year. The uh, all the other ones were dead. All the other kinds of rocks were dead. The one the frogs that were in other kinds of rocks. The ones in limestone were still alive after a year. But when he put them back in the limestone and then buried them again a year later, they were dead too. Right. So you know probably year two years that's as and it pretend it uh, depends on the type of frog as well. Like I said, because okay. some of them can hibernate 
uh, for a long time. They have some kind of, you know, they have right. they have ones that can do that. And, you know, it has to be in a rock that can get air right. into it, like that has pores or pockets. Right. Now, I've heard of frogs that, you know, can embed themselves kind of in mud a little bit and they dry out. All right. Yeah, that does happen. So, that, so okay. That's weird. That can happen. How long can one be dried out and live? That's you, ridiculous. Yeah, think it's, it's it. not like a super long time because, like I said, some of those desert ones that can do yeah. that. It's usually, it'll be like a year, a couple years, something like that. But that's still, that's still nothing, impressive. It is pretty, it is. Yeah. So you can see how that, how this might have occurred, but it's like, you know, these kind of stories of a rock or like a piece of coal, which takes a long time to form, you know, forming around a frog and it's still being alive after all that time. Yeah. There's just no way. There's no way. Like I said, biologists at the time were like, there's no way. And they even did some of the experiments to show that. They do think, too, that some of these toad-in-the-hole phenomena-type stories were just outright made up. You right. know, They said that one of the ones was probably done by Charles Dawson, yeah. who was quite famous for probably being the guy behind that whole Piltdown Man right. brouhaha. Right. So, yeah, so he probably did ones like that, too. So it seems like a lot of these are probably fake. You know, a, a lot of scientists, even at the time, were saying, you know... One, we're not getting any really proof of this. Like, no one's sending us anything. It's just like a letter saying, hey, I saw this, that, and the other thing. Yeah. And they're like, you know, maybe some of it is hoaxes. Maybe some of it is, you know, people misidentify. Maybe they're cutting some rock and then they see a frog hopping and they just assume it came out of the rock. Right. You know, shit like that. So I don't know how accurate a lot of these are because, like I said, a lot of it just came from sort of newspaper accounts or letters written to biologists saying, hey... I found a piece of coal with it. You know, they didn't have really have any proof of it. I just don't really get why there was such a fad for yeah. this particular type of... You don't really hear this type of no. stuff much anymore. I guess it's maybe like the equivalent of making up a UFO sighting. Yeah, Somewhere. maybe it was. Like I said, it just seemed like there was... It was just some kind of fashion. Yeah, where... there's more to it, though, and there's more cases. I think we need to talk a little bit more about them. I mean, there was one that I remember. Did you find the one about them making the tunnel? Yeah, but that's that's not a frog, though. That's, that's, I know it's not a frog. That's my that's my next thing. Oh, is it? Okay. So well, that's it's time, the next for, thing. time to take for a break. Okay. Well, we're going to take a break right now. And then when we come back, we're going to talk about uh, your pterodactyl yeah. thing. Yeah. And also, I wanted to talk a little bit about a couple of other ones, especially when I talk about like the Paluxy Riverbed and okay. um, the Akambaro figures and that kind of stuff. Okay. Because those have definitely been right. used in later years to uh, right. you know, support creationism and stuff like that. So we're going to take a break right now and we'll be back in just a few minutes. Okay, we're back. Now, here is like an interesting thing that I made a note of. The er in the early 19th century, 
the term living fossil was used to describe this type of phenomena, the entombed animal, the frog inside a rock, the toad in the hole, whatever. And the interesting thing was that when Charles Darwin wrote on the origin of species, he used living fossil to denote, you know, something that had lived for a long time without changing, like the coelacanth, which right, is, yeah. you know, the... the uh, Alligators. Yeah, or things like yeah. that. So he's like, well, something that hasn't evolved much, you know, or changed much over yeah. the years. So I thought it was interesting how he kind of took that phrase, which sort of meant something kind of paranormally, yeah. and made it be like an actual evolutionary term that meant a specific thing. But prior to that, it actually living fossil had meant yeah. you know because they said well a dead fossil is one like bones you find inside the rock and when we find living ones inside the rock that's a living fossil right but he took that phrase and turned it into something else so uh, I thought that was kind of an interesting thing. Okay, so this next one that you're talking about, and I yeah. remember you telling me about this, and it took me a long time to find this. Yeah, man, I remember reading this thing. Because you just told me the details, and I'm like, okay, well, how do I even Google that? But this I, I eventually the, did find it. This is back in the day when you had to buy books. Yeah. And, and <laughs> a lot of those books aren't, aren't really online yet, or the information from those books. Yeah. Not all of it has made it into the, into the new online world yet. And some of these stories are being lost, so it's hard to find this one, though. Yeah, I mean, okay. uh, once I knew what I was looking for, yeah. there was a, a lot of information about it, but okay. I didn't really know how to approach it because you didn't... You didn't know how to search for it. Yeah, right? you didn't really remember a lot of I don't of remember details. all the details, yeah. Right, because you just got it from the book. Like, it's, you know, I have the book like that. Uh, I have a book like that, too, that was like a Reader's Digest one, but yeah. I don't think it had anything like this in it. Well, I heard this story. I was like, man, this, this, this has, something like this must have happened. It sounds pretty credible. But that was, you know, back in the 90s, I read this. Yeah. And, you know, the, the world's changed a lot since then. You yeah. know, you know, I've gotten a lot older. <laughs> this story was actually published in the Illustrated London News on February 9th, 1856. Okay, the Illustrated London News. Is this a reputable newspaper? It sounds like it is. Yeah. Sounds like it was New York Times, you know, or yeah, some shit like that. Yeah, I don't really know. Now, the okay. interesting thing about this is that it wasn't, like, splashed on the front page or anything like that. It was kind uh -huh. of like a little story, like a couple paragraphs, okay. like on the back page or something like that. According to this story, in the winter of, night, of 1856, there, was, uh, there were these workmen, and they were building a railway tunnel. And they broke and removed a boulder that was supposedly Jurassic limestone. This boulder evidently broke open and then there was a creature that kind of stumbled out of it and started coming toward them. It says it fluttered its wings, croaked, and collapsed at their feet dead. Okay. Uh, it had a wingspan of 10 feet, 7 inches, four legs with talons for feet, legs joined by a membrane like a bat, and a mouth filled with sharp teeth, black, leathery, oily skin. Yeah. So they're saying this was a living pterodactyl. Okay. It was alive and it was inside a limestone, like stalactite or whatever. It yeah, was. yeah. And they discovered it. Where's the body? Exactly. Okay. <laughs> yeah. See, the problem with this was that, and I found this really, really good article where it's kind of talking about this story. Now, this story, even though it just appeared in the back page of the Illustrated London News or whatever on this particular day, hey, these dudes in France found a pterodactyl that's still right. alive, right? Which you think would be like a yeah. big deal. Right. But really, it only got repeated much later on, like in a lot of paranormal literature. Okay. And it was also used to support creationism because, you know, anything that it's like, oh, dinosaurs are still alive mm -hmm. has been used to support creation. So this, Even Nessie has been so used So this to story creation. was repeated a lot back in the day. Yeah. Okay. But well, usually in, in Fordian times, all right. you know, paranormal literature. Because the story you're telling me is not exactly the story I remember. The story I remember is that they were knocking down stalactites. One of them fell freely, and they realized it wasn't really a stalactite. It was the wings of a creature folded up around itself. It started to flutter and flap, like I said, croak, and it died. And, and I think they said it tried to fly out of the tunnel. And their explanation of why they didn't have the body is that when they took it outside in the sun, it fell apart rapidly. It turned into basically kind of like little flakes and, yeah. blew, and blew away. That's, yeah. That's very convenient. Yeah, very convenient. Well, this, okay. Now, like I said, the story was repeated many times in paranormal literature. This is the original story. Okay. This is how it appeared. A discovery of great scientific importance has just been made at Colmont. Some men employed in cutting a tunnel, which is to unite the whatever the railway lines were, mm. had just thrown down an enormous block of stone by means of gunpowder and were in the act of breaking it into pieces when from a cavity in it they saw emerge a living being of monstrous form. Okay. This creature, which belongs to the class of animals hitherto considered to be extinct, 
has a very long neck and a mouth filled with sharp teeth. It stands on four long legs, which are united together by two membranes, doubtless intended to support the animal in the air, and are armed with four claws terminated by long and crooked talons. Its general form resembles that of a bat, differing only in its size, which is that of a large goose. So it wasn't like a huge, right, you know, yeah. it, was, it was just, it was big, but not. Yeah. Its membranous wings, when spread out, measure from tip to dip 3 meters, 22 centimeters. That's about 10 feet, 17 inches. Yeah. Its color is livid black. Its skin is naked, thick, and oily. Its intestines only contained a colorless liquid like clear water. On reaching the light, this monster gave some signs of life by shaking its wings, but soon after expired, uttering a hoarse cry. This strange creature, to which may be given the name of Living Fossil, and that's all in caps, yeah. <laughs> yeah. has been brought to Gray, where a naturalist well-versed in the study of paleontology immediately recognized it as belonging to the genus Pterodactylus anas. Okay. Which many uh, many fossil remains of which have been found among the strata, which geologists have designated by the name Lias or Lias. The rock in which the monster was discovered belongs precisely to that formation. The deposit of which is so old that geologists date it to more than a million years back. The cavity in which the animal was lodged forms an exact hollow mold of its body, which indicates that it was completely enveloped with the sedimentary deposit. That that was the exact story as it was first published. That's because that's the oldest one. That's the that's original. The, yeah, that's the okay, original. So I just I, I heard a reboot of that. Yeah, okay. because like I said, it's been re yeah. you know re-engineered right. and rewritten, and the details have changed over the years. Right. Because it was published in a lot of forty and well, times. Where, where's this body? Where's this body? Right. Exactly. <laughs> okay. The here's this bottom of the mystery, and this I've read a really good article about this, and they said the problem is that. To modern sensibilities, they're like, when this story came out, yeah. the way it was written, uh -huh. they didn't expect anyone to think it was real. Real? What, really? The title of the story, when it was first published, you know, the headline, right. was very like a whale, as in a whale of a tail, oh. too big to swallow. Okay. Also, another clue was that the Latin name that mm. they gave to this uh, creature, uh -huh. Pterodactylus anas. Anas is Latin for duck. Okay. In French, duck is canard, which means a hoax. A hoax, okay. So they said, now Victorian people would have understood that. Okay. And read it and said, oh, good one. So it's an inside joke. Funny. Okay. Yeah, it was like an inside joke. They said okay. the problem is that over the years, knowledge of Latin was lost. Knowledge of uh, Victorians and their love of puns was yeah. lost. The um, culture has changed. The culture has changed so, so much seriously. that right. it was actually taken seriously. Okay. But they said when this was published, you know, obviously it was just, a, it was on a back page. It's like two paragraphs. Right. It's like, you know, if they really found a live pterodactyl, that shit would be all oh, over yeah. every newspaper oh, everywhere. Yeah. They're like, so they didn't expect any of their readers to take that seriously. It was right. just like a funny little and, trifle of a story. And the version I heard came along later when people right, took it right, seriously right. and they go, well, where's the body? Oh, well, the body blew away. It dried out quickly and right. blew away. <laughs> Right. Yeah. All so, right. you know, th that's kind of the th where that came from. And then, you know, you can see how later on as knowledge of that got lost, like yeah. people didn't know what that Latin word meant. They didn't know. There is there's a similar kind of subject or topic that maybe one day we should do a show on that sounds like there may be something to it. Evidently, the Smithsonian Institute back in the 1800s was collecting uh, skeletons from like Native American cultures and Native American artifacts. Every now and then they'd come across the buried or interned body of a Native American like chieftain or warrior that would be like seven or eight feet tall and with two rows of teeth. Oh, teeth. I remember hearing something about that. Right. We should probably do a show about that because I, right. I remember you telling me And then the body would vanish. And they blamed the guy who who uh, was the head of archaeology of uh, of the Smithsonian Institute. They were blaming him for for causing these giant skeletons to vanish because he thought that would undermine the idea of kind of like the racial superiority of the of Caucasians. Right. That he didn't want non caucasoids to be bigger. To be bigger than. Now I don't know. If that, yeah. Now I don't know if this is all a hoax and everything right. made up. Yeah. But that's the, we got to dig into that. Yeah, because I, see, that, I that. think that's what ends up happening with a lot of these like paranormal type stories and stuff like that, you know, that end up in these books later on. They just yeah. get repeated over and over. But this one, like I said, they're pretty sure the way it was written, people that kind of know about the literature of the time and the, their Victorian sense of humor right. would have known immediately yeah. that that was not real. And another thing it that makes I me wonder, it makes me wonder some of these stories about the double road teeth giants of the maybe they started off as tales like this right 
And so yeah, that's that. what's kind of right. like difficult about like right. unless you have something in front of you that is obviously right. real. Um, you know, so you can't just take someone's hearsay. You can't just say, I found this or that. And, oh, I don't know what happened to it. I lost right. it or whatever. That's like, yeah. you know, I'm sorry. Maybe that did happen to you. But unless right. you got. But this story, it should be noted, too, that the way they describe this so-called pterodactyl or, uh, you know, pterosaur is nowadays. Now they know that that's not what they look like. Yeah. And they didn't stand on four legs. They didn't look like what they're describing. Right. They said what they're describing there is. Is a, a fictional list. monstrous, right. and, you know, that turned up in like Arthur Conan Doyle stories and stuff. It's yeah, supposed on to look King like, Kong. Yeah, King Kong it, yeah, it's supposed to like they, they're yeah. like, but nowadays they know that that they don't, they didn't look like that. Yeah. Now, you know, like I said, it, the way they're describing it, and the way they're describing it is not you know, super super huge. I mean, ten feet that's pretty big, but. Yeah. They do have like fruit bats and shit like that that are pretty big. Yeah. But those are furry. So, you know, I don't even think this is a case of they just mistakenly were like, holy shit, they saw a big bat and right. thought it was a pterodactyl. It's a totally hoax story. Yeah. It seems like okay. this story was just completely fabricated right. from start to finish and then later on got repeated and cool repeated story, bro. over and over again. Cool. Yeah. Cool yeah. Story, we found bro. a pterodactyl. But yeah, so that was another pretty common thing too, living pterosaurs. And like I said, any time that you get, and that's why I used uh, at, at the beginning of the show, I used a clip from Land of the Lost because any time yeah. anytime you have evidence that dinosaurs and people are living at the same time or that dinosaurs are still alive, for some reason, creationists jump on that because they think that that supports young earth creationism for right. some reason yeah. and uh, shit like that. Yeah, so, like dinosaurs, that wasn't a long time ago. Right. Humans, it, human beings rode dinosaurs for, you know, dinosaurs. Exactly. Oh, the the reason why they live side by side is because dinosaurs were all vegetarian. Yeah. It's all bullshit. It, yeah. Oh, it's all total bullshit. And, the, and they do say that, too. <laughs> yeah, like, they're yeah. real crazy young earth creations. Yeah. yeah. They're still... Uh, yeah, dinosaurs used to be... Uh, they used to be yeah. vegetarians and we rode on them and shit. Yeah, they, yeah. they were our friends and all this Earth's kind of old, shit. bro. And it wasn't yeah. made for us. We just happened to, we <laughs> we, were, we we just just, happened to evolve on we it. We just happened to evolve by accident. And yeah, like so... Trial and error. Yeah. So another thing that uh, is usually used to support creationism are, are the very famous Akambaro figures. I don't know anything about this. Now guy. these... Okay. Educate me. There's about 33,000 of these little things. Okay. They're little ceramic figurines about yay big. Some of them are a little bit bigger. Now these... Allegedly, were found by this uh, German fella named Waldemar Julesrud. I'm sure I'm pronouncing that wrong. That was in 1944, and he supposedly found them in the Mexican city of Acambaro. Now, there were a shit ton of these figures. Some of them... What do they look like? They Some of them look like dinosaurs. Okay. So the reason that creationists like to point to them, or paranormalists like to point to them saying, look, dinosaurs were still alive, you know, just a couple thousand years ago... Because ancient people were seeing them. Yeah, the, yeah. the contention is that ancient yeah. people were seeing dinosaurs right. in front of their faces and then right. making these little figurines of them. Well, I'm going to tell you one thing, though. There is something to be said for that. A lot of these mythological creatures that the Greeks made up were the result of finding dinosaur bones. And they weren't really like the, the you know, the dinosaurs that we know. They're not the famous ones, but the, you know, the ones that just were kind of like the size and shape of kind of a horse. They'd find yeah. something like that and go, this is a uh, Cyclops. Yeah. <laughs> or they'd mix two things together because it was all coming out of the same side of the same hill. And they would like uh, go, yeah, this is a Sphinx. Well, so they really were finding weird bones. Yeah. And, and you, you know, you would extrapolate because it's right. very hard when you find a skeleton, especially of an animal you're not familiar with, to yeah. kind of imagine what that what animal looked, looked like, like when it had flesh on it. Right. You know what I so mean? They so they could they can make up all kind of fantasy. The ancients things. did see dinosaurs, but when they found them, they called they thought they were gods and yeah. giants. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So the story with this one goes: this guy, he was a German immigrant. He lived in uh, he was living in Mexico, and he was evidently he says this is the story. He stumbles upon the figures while he's riding his horse. And he hires a local farmer. He's like, I'll give you, I think he was said, I'll give you a peso for every one of these you bring me. Because yeah. it's like, wow, this says that ancient yeah. people saw dinosaurs. They were making these little dinosaurs. <laughs> I know what happened. Okay. Yeah. I can, yeah. I can you picture can, you what's going to happen. You can see where this is Yeah. Going. I'm the kind of guy that would instantly <laughs> take advantage of some, a peso for every one of these dinosaurs I find. Wow. I'm going to go I'm gonna get right. to work finding as many of them as I can. The, exactly. <laughs> and he eventually ended up with 32,000, 33,000. Yeah. <laughs> Cha-ching. 
<laughs> yes. <laughs> and, you know, so they're claiming yeah. that ancient people made these and, yeah. you know, that they were seeing dinosaurs and shit like that. The problem is that obviously when reputable scientists yeah. looked at these, they are obviously <laughs> not old. They're obviously not old. You start scratching on rocks, huh? Yeah. It's, you yeah. know, it's like according to this one guy, he's like, look, they're, they're trying to say that they're thousands of years old and shit like that. They're like, yeah. obviously not. It's like they're, none of them were broken. Right. Um, he's like, if some of them were broken, they were only like broken in half. Like somebody tried to yeah. make it look like they were old. just by. He's yeah. like, you know, real archaeologists, when you right. find like pot sherds and stuff yeah. like that, it's like we just find pieces of shit. You, don't, yeah. you know, it's very rare to find like a ceramic thing that's right. still in one piece right. that doesn't have shit missing off it. He's like, these are really, really, they look really nice. None of them, hardly any of them are broken. Let they don't have they, any soil of guess they staining, look, no abrasions, no nothing. Let me guess, they look a lot like the things that you would buy at a tourist trap. Yeah. Yeah, yeah the handmade so folk ba- art yeah. that you buy And at basically, trap, right? even though I think the guy that supposedly like gave, and so you can yeah. see some of them in various museums like around yeah. the world and stuff and they're you know I, I don't think the museums are like yeah these are proof that and they have ancient like, peoples existed and, with dinosaurs and they but, have like commonly depicted stuff like stegosaurus and yeah. piranosaurus well and the and, problem too is that a lot of the dinosaurs quote unquote don't really look like dinosaurs really looked like yeah. they said a lot of them had like mammal feet okay yeah. they're not all dinosaurs like right. some of them are little people and, and are stuff. they depicting two dinosaurs standing side by side that lived in two different eras too like, they, oh you know what I don't think anything that. mentioned that but uh, yeah, yeah I bet they probably, probably yeah <laughs> they're like wait a minute this was yeah. a Jurassic and this was a Cretaceous right, that yeah. doesn't work <laughs> that happens a lot that happens a lot in fakes well yeah because I think and I used they to see think some this, dinosaur movies and yeah, they go well, that all and together. you know all the big ticket dinosaurs right. all lived at the same time even though that was not right. the case well I used to think that when I was a little kid because sure. I used to be really into dinosaurs but when I was six or seven years old you just right. think oh T-Rex and yeah. Stegosaurus and all the really cool ones they yeah. all lived at the same time but that's sometimes yeah, there were millions and millions Stegosaurus years. fighting a Dimerodon right. you know what I mean <laughs> but the Dimerodon like, was like they, they, were like, not, they were even before the dinosaurs almost yeah so it was yeah. like yeah sometimes there were millions of years yeah. between them I mean obviously these are not old even yeah. though I have seen some creationist websites and I hope you guys appreciate because I don't really like going on creationist websites because I can't because the crazy gives me a headache uh, some creationist sites still use these as proof that ancient people actually saw dinosaurs even though like I said a lot of these dinosaurs do look they they have like little elephant type feet and yeah. they're like little mammally looking feet yeah. they don't like have they don't look reptilian <laughs> or de- they're cute and everything like yeah. they're, they're cool little figures and everything but yeah. the problem is that why can't we just appreciate them as like, hey, the local, the industrious local people made these when this German came and was, was like, hey, I'll give you a peso for it. Everybody's like, all yeah. right. Yeah. <laughs> and, that, and the farmer was like, got all his friends in yeah. on it. Start and making dinosaurs. Start boys. making dinosaurs. Yeah. They're not all dinosaurs, like I said. Some yeah. of them are like little dudes and stuff too. But uh, this, yeah, this guy totally got yeah. taken for a ride and shit like that. Because <laughs> why wouldn't he? He probably do? liked it though because he probably made money with, t- uh, you know, showing these things off. And oh, like, yeah. And, you know, making a name for himself. Right, right, right. So he was probably in on it. Yeah. And then, okay, so since we're talking about humans and uh, dinosaurs existing at the same time, let's talk a little bit about the, the so called Paluxy footprints. These are the in the Paluxy Riverbed in Texas. This is a, actually a, ver- a, a legitimate archaeological site. There are dinosaur footprints in this riverbed. All right. It, this is this is legitimate. All the scientists of all this, you know, they've done lots of studies of it. There's tons of pictures of it. All the obviously dinosaur footprints in this riverbed. Problem is that there are also some other footprints that creationists say are human, mm-hmm. and that they're from the same time period as the dinosaur footprints. Why so, why why do they say they're the same? Because they're at the same level and they seem to be side by side. Yeah. I think I've seen this case before. Yeah. It's not really what it appears to be. There's a ways no, around that. it's not. Yeah. The problem is that even though, so like I said, creationists are using this and are going to say, yeah. look, people and dinosaurs walked, if you look, it was Fred Flintstone and Dino. They were walking right next to each other, like right, in yeah. this riverbed, whatever it was. I assure you. Or thousands of years I assure ago, they're creationists. If you're a young earth creationist and you're in the audience, I'm not making funny or anything, I'm just saying that if human beings live side by side, even with the smallest of dinosaurs, Back in those days with the technology that humans had access to, humans would be toast. Yeah. <laughs> even, yeah. even small even small raptors, four foot, five foot tall raptors would tear humans apart. Yeah. You just couldn't survive next to them. Humans couldn't live. They were in, top of the food chain. So. Yeah. Humans couldn't even live 
in the Americas until the short faced short -faced bear. bear went extinct. Yeah. And the short faced bear would have just been annihilated by dinosaurs. That's how badass dinosaurs and the short faced short faced bear were. So humans could not live side by side with dinosaurs. Yeah. You'd be I mean, food. Look, You'd be at the bottom of the food chain. Are the just... insects would probably kill you. Yeah. Because there were cockroaches that were nearly a foot long back then and they had dragon <laughs> they had dragonflies. <laughs> Dragonflies with nearly six foot wingspans that could take a bite out of you the size of an apple. Think about that for a while. That's... The bugs would kill you. Okay. I mean, when so... you think about it, human beings, yeah, we're smart and everything. We can right. build shit, which is pretty much the only thing we have going for us. Yeah. Because other than that, we Brains are, would not we help are you. furless yes. little meat bags. Brains would not help you in the dinosaur era. I don't think so. Only no. size, armor, and weapons did. Yeah. It was an arms much. race, a biological arms race. Yeah. yeah. So anytime I see this shit about humans and dinosaurs existing side by side. No. The problem with a lot of the quote-unquote human footprints found at the Paloxy Riverbed. Okay, they know for sure that some of them are fake. People that locals have carved them, mm -hmm. you know, to either sucker in tourists or to, you know, support creationism or whatever. The ones that are not faked are obviously not human. Even though they're smaller, yeah. they're like, here, okay, they're like, here's the problem. The dinosaur ones that they know are dinosaur ones. They're like, you can tell how much the dinosaur weighed... By right. how deep it is. the footprint is in there. They're like, some of the human footprints are as deep as the dinosaur ones, even though the dinosaur probably outweighed the person right, yeah. by like, you know, 10 to 100 times. So they're like, so obviously that's wrong. Also, some of the human ones, quote unquote, they're like, if you look at them very closely, some of them have toes sticking out the side or like a claw mark in the back. And they're like, so it's obviously a smaller dinosaur yeah, footprint that is like eroded by the water and makes it look vaguely like a human shaped uh, okay. footprint. So as much as creationists like to tout this, although it should be noted that some of the creationists in their uh, literature and in their textbooks and stuff like that, because they have those, have warned other creationists not to use this anymore as proof of creationism just because it's been chipped away at so much. Right. Some of them are still using it, but some of them actually do have the presence of mind to say, hey, don't use that anymore because that's been debunked. That's kind of another thing. Now, let's this last topic I want to get, this is, I don't know a great deal about this, but this is something that keeps coming up too in regards to pseudo-archaeology and mm -hmm. shit like that. This is uh, the Moab Man, or also called the Malachite Man. I've never heard of this one. And this was, yeah, this was something I just kind of came across when I was researching, and I thought it was kind of interesting. This is a bunch of human skeletons, and they were built bulldozing in a mine. Now, the rock that they bulldozed it out was uh, supposedly dated from the early Cretaceous period, so which is about 140 million years ago. So creationists are saying, oh, well, these are obviously humans you know they're young earth creationists so they're saying right. obviously the geology is wrong this rock isn't as old as right. as you say and all this other kind of shit because there was humans in it now this discovery was originally made in 1971 and then later on i think in the 90s they they found some more of them some of the skeletons have actually been bought carl bow who is a creationist who one of the ones that still touts the Pelexi footprints he actually bought the skeleton to put in his creation science museum as proof that you know the the earth is young and shit like that. Problem is that when legitimate scientists looked at these skeletons, but they are real human skeletons, is that they are not old. They're not, They're old. not as old as the rock. Carbon, They're like, you can carbon date them probably. Yes, they've yeah. been carbon dated to between 210 and 1,450 years old. They're like, so these people were either deliberately buried, like yeah. in a ceremonial thing, or yeah. they were accidentally buried, like in a rock slide or something right. like that. Because there's a bunch of them. These are not obviously right. Cretaceous right. era right. people. These were just poor guys that were buried in this particular cave or this particular type yeah. of rock or were buried, like I said, by a rock slide and then were found later. many years later. But yeah, they, they said they're only between 200 and 1,500 years old. That's mm -hmm. all they are. So I guess we're kind of getting to the end of the show. This kind of yeah. went off in a bunch of different directions, but it was yeah. kind of interesting. Though. Yeah. And I'm, I'm we... actually kind of glad that yeah. you brought this uh, up because this well, was kind of a weird rabbit hole that well, I went down into. Well, we got down to the bottom of the uh, pterodactyl story. Yeah. We know where that came from. Yeah. Did we ever actually really get down to the bottom of the frog stories? Not really, because like I said, most of the accounts of them were secondhand. Right. Or there was no corroborating evidence. It was right. usually just like people saying, hey, we were working in this mine or we right. were, you know, uh, drilling this rock yeah. and, and a frog jumped out. 
it's it's kind of hard to experiments say that it's not possible. Yeah, a frog and, cannot survive. And there have been at least two experiments done. Right. Uh, one in the 1700s, one in the 1800s, where they attempted to put a rock, you know, put a frog inside a rock and see if it would live, and none of them did. Now these supposed frogs that jumped out of the rock, no one ever came forth with that individual frog and presented it, saying this is the frog that came yeah, out. Yeah, evidently no? not. It's like so the you only, can't really identify the species. The only of frog photograph that I've ever seen, and I'll put, and I'll probably put it in the YouTube video, there is a photograph of a rock. It kind of looks like a geode, actually, but I don't think it's a geode, but it kind of has that similar kind of look. And it's got like a like a hole kind of, it's like cut in half, and then there's like a little mummified, dried up frog in there. But the thing is, it's like, that could be faked. Yeah, you get a f- dried up mummified frog, like I find it on the back of the, on, on, on back of the windows in the back of the house, that the cat kills, <laughs> and, you, and you put that next to a geode and go, dude, that was in there. Right. Yeah. And the, and a similar thing happened. It seemed like when there was such a such a fad for this kind of shit, some people tried to like put it in museums and stuff. Like, look at this thing that was found. And like naturalists came forward and were like, don't put take that out of the museum. Okay. That's bullshit. Now, what about <laughs> the stories of frogs coming out of coal? That you, I couldn't really find. Couldn't it, find anything no, like it was mostly just it was rocks, limestone. I remember some of them jumping concrete. out. Jump, I remember some of the stories said that they jumped out of the fireplace or they jumped out of the furnace. There might be stories like that, but I couldn't really, for that really didn't seem like one of the most common things. I think now that I'm looking at it, though, I would say that these stories stopped coming, didn't they? You hear ones every now and then, but you don't really, uh, like I said, it seemed like a lot of them were around the end of the 19th century. There seemed to be kind of a trend. You would think that if this was a real phenomenon, that it would continue up to the present day. Well, yeah, obviously. Hey, man, I saw this, I saw this frog jumped out of a rock. Yeah. You know, I found it had a little pocket. Because one of the stories I remember reading is that they had a rock and it cracked in half when they were working. And a frog jumped out of it. They caught the frog. Yeah. And they found inside the frog per- perfect indentations and upper and lower indentation. And they put the frog next to the indentation and he went right back in there and nestled <laughs> himself in. And that he liked to go back into the tour. <laughs> And they said that they checked and his mouth had been sealed shut. And all of his openings except the nostrils had all grown shut hmm. as if to, to save water. Weird He's story. All but I was up. almost kind of buying it. You know what I mean? I'm 17, 16 reading this shit and I'm going, yeah, maybe that maybe maybe that could happen. I mean, like I said, it's not. There are some types of frogs, like I said, yeah. that can hibernate for a long time, yeah. like underneath the desert sand. And, and at sixteen, not... you're like, why would they lie? <laughs> <laughs> oh, you sweet summer child. <laughs> why would they lie? Yeah. Well, and the thing about it is, it's like sometimes too, like the like the story about the pterodactyl. It's like they weren't necessarily lying. That was just a joke that they didn't expect anyone to take seriously. Right, yeah. Then just later on, people right. read that and were like, what the fuck? They found a pterodactyl. And then they yeah. started publishing it right. in these paranormal books without really checking if it was right. true or not. So it, it's not so much lying. I mean, they probably thought it was a true well, story. They the, heard it from somewhere. The frog stories always mystified me because they gave details, but they never made any claims. Yeah, they like never really that's made what, any claims that what was is, what, what the oddest thing about it that I found because yeah. there are so many like little accounts of it, but I'm yeah. like, why? That seems like a weird thing. Because usually, if you're gonna hoax a story, all right, there's a claim that goes along. For, yeah. for instance, I saw this light in the sky. It did this. It outperformed a jet. It did this. so. Therefore, it was aliens. Therefore, there's life on the other planets. Right. You would think that it would be something like, I found a frog, it was in a rock, it would do Therefore, I don't even know what the claim would be. Well, like Therefore, I said, it does seem like a creationist type of claim. But they don't make, but they never but say, they never right. say, therefore, the earth is not old. They never say that. Not really. They no. never make a claim. Yeah. They just say, we found it, there it is. Look at that. It's just the, it's the, amazing. the frog jumped out and put yeah, on a top amazing. hat and started yeah. singing show tunes. <laughs> they never make the young earth claim. Yeah, not and until later. That seemed like the stories were picked yeah, but, up later. But by they started in the 1500s, so it went on yeah. for hundreds of years before somebody made the claim of yeah. young earth that's creation. What, that's what was so odd about that's it. That's what I'm saying. Like, what a weird thing to make up. Yeah, but like I said, you know... Cocaine's the cul- a hell of a drug. I guess. Well, the culture is so different. <laughs> yeah. Like, you know, now it it's, the, it's hard to extrapolate back to what, what they people were back thinking. then were thinking and right. like what, what else was going on in the culture right. that might have inspired that. Right. You know, maybe there was some popular novel at the time that's right. been forgotten about that had that in it. Because even when everybody was like, oh, that's a neat idea. Even you know, with, we don't know. Even with airship sightings, okay, and there were some bunch of weird airships. Got, there were there was a claim. Yeah. The claim was is that flight was possible. Right. And that airliners and things like Zeppelins want, were coming. Yeah. And they did come. It was only a matter of time that, yeah, there were Zeppelins. Woo. You know. 
Yeah, they, they called that one. <laughs> well, they had the idea. They, yeah. yeah they, they, they had the ideas. and then But some people were claiming that, no, they already exist. Yeah. Zeppelins already exist. We saw them. They threw down an anchor and they came, They slid down the, the, the anchor <laughs> line. They asked for coffee and they climbed back up and they left. You guys didn't see it? Everybody here saw it. I like airship stories. I find it weird that they can, may, they can build an airship, but they can't even put a coffee pot on it. Yeah. They have to come down yeah. to the ground and, and they, get coffee. And they, they had a strange accent. They came from somewhere else. <laughs> But so we don't have coffee on our plate. The weird thing, the weird thing about airship stories is that there's a possibility that a couple of them might be might be real. When the airship is not really described as being really fantastic, like it was only forty feet long and only had one guy in it. Yeah, you're like, did some dude? Maybe he just built that. Some <laughs> it built that? Yeah, it's so, not impossible. Not, not impossible. I mean, you know, it's because it's unlikely. Later but... on in France, they had guys that, that had money that built them and pedaled them. Yeah. Like a bicycle, yeah. and then tried to land them near their local cafe so everyone could see them. Yeah, that's a forgotten phenomenon, but that shit happened. Yeah, back in France, <laughs> you know, the French were doing that in the eighteen hundreds. <laughs> personal zeppelins. Oh, well, I wouldn't really call it a zeppelin. A Dir- dirigible. A yeah. personal dirigible. <laughs> yeah, they were trying. You know, noblemen. You know, they had money. They well, had yeah. some education. And they, they had money and obviously a lot of time. On their a lot hands. of time. You know, they didn't work for a living. They were on that royal welfare. Yeah. You know? And they actually had like bicycle chain driven propellers yeah. that they could try pedal this damn thing and evidently could steer them. There was one French nobleman that could steer it and land it. And he was famous for it. I don't remember call his name. This is all off the top of my head. But that to at least a certain extent did happen. So it makes well, like me wonder. Well, like I said, that's not a super crazy claim because super they crazy. did develop those later on. Yeah, so later it's on. it's not be... crazy to say somebody figured it out right. beforehand. Right. They had... Guys that were like rich noblemen doing their thing ahead of, ahead of the curve. Yeah. Basically, you know. <laughs> kind of cool. Yeah, it was. But uh, yeah, the, the the frogs from rocks, man. Weird. What were they thinking to uh, even make up those lies? I don't know. Yeah. That's what that's what fascinated me about yeah. reading all these stories about it. That's why I'm glad you suggested it because I probably never would have. Just a blast in the past. Time. You never hear that one anymore. No, it's a, yeah, yeah. That seems to have uh, kind of gone by it's the wayside in the of literature. So that'll do it for episode ninety. Gosh, only ten more episodes, and we have to do our special edition hundredth episode. Yeah. But uh, yeah, that'll be coming up. So I uh, hope you guys enjoyed this kind of rambling discussion, uh, mm. as as they usually are. <laughs> yeah. Remember, if you like, if you like the show, remember to like, share, subscribe, uh, share with all your friends, and uh, go to our Facebook page, go to our Twitter, whatever. Uh, if you'd like to financially support the show, go to our Patreon at patreon.com slash 13 o'clock podcast, or go to our blog at 13 o'clock podcast dot wordpress dot com. And there's a link in the sidebar to a PayPal account if you'd like to give a one time donation that way. Also, be sure to check out our latest movie review, which was Dagon, directed by Stuart Gordon, uh, based on the H.P. Lovecraft story, The Shadow Over Its Mouth. And uh, also check out our Zazzle store at Zazzle.com slash 13 o'clock. And we have shirts and a t-shirt that you may purchase if you would like. And that'll do it for episode 90 about 40 and archaeology. Bye.